Remergon, with some visual representation through Blender. Welcome to the Sod Raid, boys. Your first encounter is Grubbis. You talk to the NPC, then you'll have to deal with three waves of mobs coming out of the Northern Cave. The South Cave will then open up and introduce you to these irradiated clouds. They will spawn in one of these three locations. These pulsate 75 nature damage every two seconds, raid-wide. They will follow the person that was closest to them when they spawned. If you drag the cloud into the trogs, it will deal 200% of the trog's health and damage in an 8-yard radius, which means you can kill an entire wave of trogs with one cloud. This is a scripted spell that only harms the trogs that spawn in the waves. This consumes the cloud, so it will no longer produce a raid-wide AoE. After three waves from the south cave, Grubbis will spawn from the north, along with his pet, the basilisk Chomper. Chomper has a two-second cast called Petrify. If this goes uninterrupted, it will drop threat on his current tank target, for the duration of the stun, which is 8 seconds, unless it is dispelled. This can be interrupted. Having a tank with an interrupt is ideal for Chomper. Waves of Trogs will still spawn throughout the boss fight. Clouds will spawn at intervals of 30 seconds. Depending on the boss's health, 2 or 3, if under 50%, 25% by the tick, respectively. Radiation is a 3 second cast. He got ass and it do fart. 90 degree cone from his back end. It's a knockback and it gives you a debuff, signifying that you just got crop dusted. Grubbis Mad is a melee radius tantrum. It hits four times every six seconds and it's negligible. Trog Rage is a attack speed increase with a temporary threat drop. This is countered by taunting the boss if he decides to hit somebody else. To sum up, this is pretty much a tank and spank with drag the mobs into death. You should be able to kill him within a minute of him spawning. You can run the boss into a cloud to consume it, but it'll give him a buff for 25% additional damage for 30 seconds. Jumping into Vicious Fallout. Around the floor of the room, you'll see these bracers, or corpses of water elementals. This is relevant to his irradiated goo summon. If the irradiated goo reach these, it'll turn into a desiccated fallout, which will cast a raid-wide ability that needs to be interrupted or stunned. The goos and desiccated fallouts have the same health. You can tank the boss near one of these, kill the two that aren't going toward it, then kill it when it spawns. Then you have a full minute where this is not going to happen again, he's probably dead anyway. The thing he does is produce an AoE on the ground called Sludge. Every 16 seconds you have to move him out of this puddle and to make it comfortable for your melee. You don't have to move a lot, it's not that big. If you want a micro, you can have him in halfway. The next fight's pretty fun. Crowd Pummeler. I'm going to go on a tangent with the claw here in a minute. So his main signature ability is called Nimbergon Smash. It affects an area like this. It's a bar in front of the boss. If you're having trouble discerning how it's going out, just look at his feet. Those toes point to the direction of death. It is not a cone. It is a straight line. You'll also have these gears that are moving around the room that'll do a knockback. If anything causes you to get knocked into the bombs at the entrance, it will do an ability called Get Back In There. It does 2,000 damage, but it's easily avoidable. If you get knocked off the platform, you will basically die. The entire area underneath the platform is irradiated and will just insta-dead you. Upon reaching 30%, he will do an ability called The Claw. There's a lot of misconception with The Claw. It doesn't do damage to you outright. It does damage over time to you when you're picked up. What is killing people is a charge bug. Blizzard either refuses or can't fix it, which is the momentary root at the end of the charge, which causes him to melee his closest target. So if you want to survive this every time, go to your tank when you get the claw, or have your tank come to you when you are targeted for the claw. So the person getting meleeed is the person highest on his threat table and also not out of reach at the end of the charge. Or you can blink it, or you can bop it. You're dying to a melee that's not intended for you. Three years. Okay, there's the end of my tangent. Anyone who has done Nomergon before will probably be confused on the direction that they have to go from this point. The irradiated walkway underneath would be the most common way to get to the last boss. You can't go there, obviously, because you'll die, so you have to go toward the workshop door. It is kind of fun ripping off the roofs of these instances. The next boss will not patrol where the elevator stops, so stay in that area if you don't want to miss bolt. Electrocutioner. 6,000. He has three signature abilities. This compobulation protocol is a raid-wide knockback. This will happen roughly every 30 seconds. Magnetic Pulse. Visually represented very well, thank you, Yippee! is a uh, magnet around a player that pulsates every 2.5 seconds and also does damage to those that are around them. If a player affected by this pulls somebody in, that person pulled in can run out before it pulsates again. It's completely fine. You just want to get away from other people so you don't disrupt their play until it gets off of you. It lasts like 16 seconds. And the big thing is static arc. If you don't have coordination, this is where your pug will fail. You need two groups of three. You can do this with melee. You can do this with range. It's just, it's relevant of distance. The person who is furthest from the boss will be targeted. This will chain to the two closest players to them. You can have six people positioned at range, have person from group A be the furthest back, chaining to their two. The person from group B become the furthest back, chaining to their two. The consequence of getting hit with this twice in 20 seconds equals death. There is around 15 seconds between each cast, so you do need two groups. 
If you have next to no range, you can do this with melee. Just coordinate left and right back sides. It's all relative. If your group is confident in handling static arc, you can use the walls to mitigate the knockback effect and reposition yourselves appropriately for the arc when needed. Here's a fun themed fight. The Mechanical Menagerie. Here you'll see Nutter Butter, Chicken, Little Lamb, and Bad Dragon. You can claim it's something else, you know what you're doing. Gonna clear up a general misconception with the sheep, it doesn't explode if you get near it. I know it alludes to that, it comes from the explosive sheep engineering. All these are engineering pets, that's the gimmick, but no, that's not here. Each animal has an aura, or a periodic aura, an area effect buff, and a signature ability. I'm gonna start off with the auras. The sheep has static fleece. Every two seconds, it'll stun someone in melee range for one second. The dragon has slag ember. It'll put down a fire underneath itself every five seconds, unless it's casting something else. These are three yards in radius. The squirrel has a constant aura called nutty shield, reducing all damage done to it by 25%. And the chicken will spawn an egg roughly every 20 seconds. If the egg is left alive for 10 seconds, it'll become armed. Coming into 10 yards of it after it is armed will cause it to explode 10 yard radius fire damage. Two of the area effect buffs are particularly scary, each lasting 15 seconds except for the squirrels, which is 30. All are 10 yard AoEs. The sheep has a buff called frayed wiring, making it so him and his allies in range will reflect all damage done to them. The dragon's buff is overheat. This makes each buffed ally deal 70 fire damage every second, and increase the damage they take by 25%, lasting for 15 seconds. The squirrel puts down a placed AoE that reduces damage taken by 50%. This does not benefit players. The chicken uses Cluck to buff his allies with 50% increased attack speed. Overheat and Widget Fortress are negligible. Frayed Wiring is wipe or don't damage for 15 seconds if it is applied to all of his allies. Shouldn't happen since you should keep them away from him. Cluck is 15 seconds of your tanks being in pain. Each of these has a 3 second cast. You can split tank the chicken away from the group as it's going to cast Cluck and drag it back into the party after it is cast if you are worried about healing being difficult. And lastly are their signature abilities. The sheep does binary bleat. It is an 8 yard AoE silence. Very few know what this does because nobody really stays close to this thing. The dragon has sprocket fire breath. This is a 60 yard bar in front of it that channels for five seconds, applying a stacking dot to those who stay within it. The squirrel's widget volley is a casted interrupt that can be interrupted, interruptception. And the chicken has peck. It's essentially a free melee to go with its auto attacks. This mob does the most damage to your tank. Traditionally, this fight will go keeping the sheep away from the three pack, one tank tanking the chicken, the other tank taking the squirrel and the dragon, shuffling out of the fire this place down, cleaving the egg down with the rest of them. If your healing can handle it, you can leave them in for cluck. You can absolutely leave all of them in for overheat. If you are struggling for mana during this fight, there are buttons around the room that you can click, essentially life tapping your resources, trading 30% of your health for 20% mana. Don't stand in the place fire on the ground as it applies the same debuff that the breath does. You wanna work these guys down together, as once any of them reach 1% health, they will begin a cast to repair themselves. You then have a 20 second window to kill the remaining bosses. And that's the entire fight. Almost immediately after you complete this encounter, Mechaneer Thoroughplug will spawn. His aggro radius is about 10 yards. If anyone is unaware of this, or you attempt to loot the bosses near the center of the room, you may prematurely trigger his RP, which begins the boss fight. Any attempt to salvage by resetting or running out will be in vain, because past the lasers, which would damn near instantly kill you, there is a kill zone for the entirety of the tunnel. If parsing and world buffs matter to you, please pay heed to not trigger the boss early. Mechaneer Thermoplug is a five-stage fight. Really, four, but why not? A huge portion of this fight is handling the bombs. What we found out what best works is having two powerhouse range that can drop them in moments, cycling between killing the bombs and clicking the button, and trading off for every other one. The six statues around the room produce bombs. There's a button on the side makes it so they don't spawn the bombs for a while. These life tap buttons take away 30% of your health, give you 20% mana, increase your movement speed by 100 for five seconds. First phase bombs are fire. They match the same element as the boss. They'll leave a patch of fire on the ground. Second phase will leave a patch of ice on the ground. Third phase will leave a patch of poison on the ground. These will all apply the same debuff that is affecting the tank. Each phase, the boss will do an element swipe toward the tank. Phase one, fire robot. Every 5 to 10 seconds, they'll do a frontal swipe. This will affect the tank and anyone in front of the boss, leaving a debuff. It does 100 fire damage per stack, lasting for 30 seconds. 
About 35 seconds in, he'll cast Furnace Surge. This pulsates that fire debuff in front of him in the same frontal arc every second. This lasts for 10 seconds. He has slowed to 80% during this. This is counteracted by the tank kiting him away until he stops the channel. You can one tank this if your DPS is high enough, or if you opt with a Paladin tank to bubble. You should be able to transition this phase with your tank at 8 or less stacks. Phase 2 is a frost variant of the robot. This one hits the tank particularly hard, and applies a movement slow with every stack of its swipe, which can become obnoxious for the people dealing with the bomb situation, as that debuff is both shared by the bombs and his raid-wide pulse, which is called coolant discharge. It happens roughly every 24 seconds. When the stacks get to 11, it freezes the target. Both the stacks and the ice block effect are cleansable. If you want to be mana savvy, you just cleanse when somebody becomes an ice block. And that should only ever be the tank if you have the bombs under wrap. If his coolant discharge goes off while somebody is currently ice blocked, it will wipe the raid. Keep your bomb crew fast. Cleanse only who you have to. If someone's high, you can have them stand in a patch till they freeze, and then cleanse the freeze. Do so as necessary. Phase 3 is a poison variant of the robot. Its swipe leaves a debuff that increases poison damage by 50%. This disease can be cleansed, and should always be cleansed off your main tank. The added gimmick for this phase is Toxic Ventilation. This is a channeled cast. It doesn't have a cast bar, you just interrupt it and it stops him from doing raid-wide damage. Once you push this phase, you'll get a variant of the Verbal Cut XD. Lol, that's wild, bro. It does every variation of ability that the previous robots do, but so offset that it doesn't matter. You'll have a kite phase, which is a repeat on tank damage. You'll have a spot of cold here. You'll have an interrupt needed there. You beat this one down to zero health, where the others were 50% before this. And then Shinji gets out of the robot. You give him a physical beatdown in place of a psychological one, and you get loot. If your bomb squad is amazing and your healers are on point, this fight is pretty chill. If it's a ragtag bunch of people just spamming wild growth, you're not going to have a good time. Again, you can use buttons around the room, get mana. If this ends up being something that is difficult, please come back with people that you trust. I assure you this fight is not super hard. Thank you for watching. These videos get some criticism for being late to the party. I prefer to have illustration and accuracy over being first. Here is a list of the sources and content that I have used. Here's how my YouTube climb is going. Hitting a thousand subs would mean a lot to me. Like, subscribe, and comment. I enjoy the conversation. Thank you to my Patreon supporter. Links to my Twitch and Patreon if you're interested. And I will see you again soon. TM.